All right, good evening, New Life. I'm happy to be able to share the word with you tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to dig into uh, John chapter 21, and I want to talk to you on the thought, setbacks prepare us for comebacks. Setbacks prepare us for comebacks. I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to skip through and read s- some different uh, verses here in chapter 21. Uh, beginning in verse 1, Later, Jesus again appeared to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. Verse 3, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all that night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but his disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, Fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, Throw out your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll get some. And so they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. In verse 15, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Three times Jesus asked him that same question, do you love me more than these? I think it hurt Simon Peter's uh, feelings that Jesus would uh, keep asking him that question. But in verse 18, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Anyone that's heard me preach more than a few times, you probably know that I, I love sports. Uh, especially, I love a good comeback story. I, I love to read stories, to hear stories, watch movies, um, see it in real life situations where someone is the big underdog and it seems like everything is going against them and, and yet this person, in spite of overwhelming obstacles, uh, they, they manage to turn things around in, in spite of everything that's come against them. I love that kind of story. And, and when I'm, I mean, if I'm watching a ball game and, uh, and an underdog starts to lose, I, I maybe subconsciously even start to root and pull for, for them, even if they're not my favorite team, uh, because I love to watch a good comeback story. Now, now my favorite comeback game was... It's, it's been a little while, but it was 1991, and it's the Tennessee Volunteers and the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and, and I'm a Tennessee Vols fan and, and have been for about 35 years, so, so just bear with me if you're not a fan. But in, in that year, Notre Dame was ranked number five in the nation, and they're playing Tennessee, who's ranked number 13 at the time. The game's being played in Notre Dame, and they were favored to win, and in fact, they were destroying my beloved Volunteers. And by the end of the first quarter, it's 21 to nothing, Notre Dame winning. At the, near the end of the, of the first half, Notre Dame is now up 31 to 7. And at this point, I mean, I'm not really that interested in even watching the rest of the game. But just before halftime, Notre Dame sent its kicker in to try to kick a 32-yard field goal. And, and Tennessee blocks it. And, and runs it back 85 yards for a touchdown. And, and so it suddenly goes from 31-7 to 31-14. And I guess this sudden, this un- sudden and unexpected change in the, in the game must have did something for the Vols during halftime. I don't know what Lou Holtz said during his halftime speech, but they came out looking like a completely different team. And, and they took over the second half and and, and kept scoring and ten, continued to score and stopped. And, and in the second half, Notre Dame kicked one field goal the whole second half. And, and with four minutes left in the game, Tennessee scores another touchdown and they take the lead 35-34. Notre Dame gets the ball and they drive down, down the field all the way down to the, to the nine-yard line. And with four seconds left, it's, they're on the nine-yard line. It's fourth and three. And they send out the field goal kicker. This field goal kicker was the replacement because the, the regular kicker sprained his knee during the third quarter. So he goes out to make this really short field goal, his first try 
his first try ever in his career, and it's now almost late November. They snap the ball. A defensive end from Tennessee comes flying across the field, stretches out, dives to try to stop or block the ball, but he's going so fast, so quickly, he actually misses the ball and dives past it as the kicker is kicking, and instead of hitting, with it, hitting it with his hand, he misses it, but somehow the, the ball hits him in, in the rump. It hits him on his backside and just grazes him enough to deflect the ball, and the ball goes wide right. Tennessee wins the game 35-34. Biggest, the biggest upset Notre Dame had ever had in their own home stadium. Tennessee's biggest comeback, at least in my mind. And I, I, I loved that, that outcome, loved that story. But let me take you back to the, even to the sermon title, Setbacks Prepare Us for Comebacks. Because there are times in life when you feel like you're losing and you feel like things need to turn around. So I'll share five life lessons with you that I, I've observed with the Apostle Peter that says to us we can have a comeback. Peter's life was certainly that of, of a lot of different setbacks, and, and he had some comebacks. He, he had a fantastic comeback. But we want to look at him and his life and how he goes from the really a feeling like such a failure, having a sense of hopelessness, to heights of faith and power and power in God and success in in, in, in ministry, and how did he get there from, from where he was? Setbacks prepare us for comebacks. And you'll have those setbacks. Sometimes those setbacks happen because of, of things that you've done and decisions you've made. Like, like Peter, he had a lot of setbacks that were because of his own doing. But sometimes you'll have setbacks in life that have nothing to do with your choices, but they're just things that happen in life. But you still need a comeback. But I do see a couple problems, a couple common problems people, people make when dealing with setbacks. The, the first is thinking, I've got to fight this battle alone. No, God didn't call you to fight the battle alone. You're never to do it alone. Another common mistake is thinking that I can't do it, so someone else will have to do it for me. And that thinking is incorrect. If you're going to have a comeback, here, well, here's life lesson one for you. God will do it for you. He just won't do it without you. God will do it for you, but he, but he is not going to do it without you. In other words, you've got to remain plugged into the process. You can't sit back and expect God or, or anyone else just to come in and, and fix you or fix your life or your situation without you having to be involved in the whole process. And let me also say, st stop feeling sorry for yourself. If you've had a setback in life, stop feeling sorry for yourself, especially if it's one of those that you didn't cause by your own decisions. Stop whining and complaining and and stop looking at yourself as a victim, because God never called you to be a victim. Start seeing yourself as God sees you, and you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. So remember, God will do it for you. He's just not going to do it without you. So, let's keep moving. And let me ask you the question, have you ever felt like you were maybe taking one step forward and, it, and then two steps back? I'm sure the Apostle, Paul, Apostle Peter did, because he made so many mistakes along the way. We know the big one. I mean, at the time of crucifixion, he denies Christ. He, he abandons him. He leaves him alone to die. But before this happened, Peter had already, he had this pattern of setbacks and comebacks. Let me show you some. In, in Matthew 16, Jesus and his disciples are, are talking and, and Jesus is asking, well, what do the crowds say about me? Who do they say that I am? And Peter is the first one to speak up, and he says, well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, and it was like, wow. And Jesus was probably like, wow, Peter, that's awesome. You get it. That's, 
And he, well, he says to him, you are a rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And, and theologians have debated for centuries exactly what Jesus meant when he said that phrase to Peter, but what I believe happened is when Jesus said this to Peter, I mean, it went straight to his head, and man, it just swelled. Because it was just a few minutes later, Jesus told his disciples that he was, he was eventually going to die, and, and Peter, somehow thinking that yeah, maybe he and Jesus, they're co-captains now. He, he pulls Jesus aside and he says, Oh, never, Lord. Uh, this will never happen to you. And Jesus turns and he looks in him. And he says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. I mean, he calls him Satan. So much for that co-captain theory, right? But this was a repeated pattern. Setbacks and comebacks. Because, go back a little further. Earlier in Matthew 14, the disciples... They take a boat across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus stays behind to pray. And then later that night, the disciples, they, they look out onto the sea, and in this distance, they see this figure coming towards them across the water, and they're, they're freaked out, they're afraid, they thought it was a ghost, and of course it was Jesus. And, he, and Jesus cries out to him, says, It's I, don't be afraid. And, and Peter takes this bold step of faith. Lord, if, it's, if this is really you, tell me to, to come to you on, on the water. And Jesus says, well, come on. And Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on water. But then he starts to notice the wind and the waves and he becomes afraid and, and he begins to sink. Now, thankfully, he, he cries out, Jesus, save me. And, and of course, Jesus saves him. But we, we see Peter... I mean, he, he gets a taste of success, and then he loses focus, and then, he, and then he falls down. And that was kind of a repeated pattern in his life. We see it again. You, you see it on the, the Mount of Transfiguration. He, he says the wrong thing. You see it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he, he strikes violently a, a Roman soldier with his sword, and Peter has a, has a little bit of success. And then he has failure, and it's happening throughout his life. Setbacks and comebacks. And maybe you're watching this and you're feeling like, that's a lot like me. I keep having this same repeated pattern, keep having setbacks, and God keeps bringing me out of it and get a comeback, but I seem to fail and have another setback again. And It's like you taste victory, but then you fall back. And every time you say the, the right thing, it seems like just around the corner is something else that happens and then you react or respond and you seem to say the wrong thing. And if you're, you're doing that and following that pattern, you're not alone. I mean, you're doing things a lot like Peter did. But why does that keep happening? So the question is, what keeps causing me to fall? Why do I keep having setbacks? Here's a few reasons that I see, at least in Peter's life. Uh, one was his impulsiveness. It, it was a pattern for him, and I think it led to a lot, of, a lot of downfalls, a lot of setbacks. Those things kept happening in his life because he established this pattern of impulsiveness. Because Peter's this spur-of-the-moment kind of guy. He, he would say things quickly. He did things quickly. He didn't, he didn't take the time to consider the consequences or to think it through. He just reacted. He was a react-first kind of guy. Re react before thinking. And I've known, known a lot of folks with that kind of, that kind of mindset too. Uh, they have the philosophy, well, there's no point in doing nothing and we need to get busy doing something. Let's do something, I mean, even if it's wrong. And yeah, I've even been guilty of it at times, more, more times than I care to admit. And I can make decisions quickly and, and sometimes too quickly. Being decisive is good, but being impulsive, that's not so good. But life lesson two is this. If you're an impulsive person work to develop the habit of slowing down. If you're an impulsive person, work to develop the habit of slowing down. I mean, even ask for advice before making a decision. 
Do some things to develop a habit of making yourself settle down, think things through, get advice, take a, take a little longer to make the decision. Doing things that will get you out of the habit of just making impulsive decisions, impulsive reactions. Think it through. Another attitude that leads to a downfall is, is believing in yourself too much. And that's really overconfidence. We see Peter being overconfident at the, at the Last Supper. Jesus says to him, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. <laughs> you remember what Peter says? <laughs> In Matthew 26, 35, he says, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. <laughs> Peter's got a lot of faith. Unfortunately, it wasn't faith in Jesus. It was faith in his own self. And it wasn't a case of confidence. It, it was a case of overconfidence. Paul warns us about it, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. What's Paul saying? He's saying don't put too much faith in yourself. And that's easy to do sometimes. And you've probably seen it in, 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 in the world of sports where a, a team that's really good and they're they're highly favored, highly ranked. They can become overconfident and cause them to get beat. In the early 2000s, the, uh, the L.A. Lakers, they had Shaq and Kobe, and, and, and they won three titles in a row, and they seemed like they were the most dominant team. I mean, they won the championship in 2000 and 01 and 02. Uh, they ran up against the San Antonio Spurs in 03, but in 2004, they get back to the NBA Finals. And they, they assume that they're going to easily uh, beat this Detroit Pistons team that they're going to face, and, and they're going to get another championship. L.A. Lakers, I mean, they had all these dominant players, these great superstars, these Hall of Famers. But they weren't expecting to, to come up against a team that had learned some things by having to fight through some battles, struggling to, to, to win. They came up against a, a team, not with better players, but they came up against a team that was just a better team, that understood teamwork that understood they, they had to rely upon those brothers beside them and that together, if they worked hard together and believed in each other's and each other's abilities and they followed the game plan, that they could be a better team and overcome the better superstars. And, and they did it. And they, they did win the NBA championship, beat L.A. in five games and, and won the title. Life lesson three is this. When tempted to become overconfident, remind yourself, I am nothing without God's grace. I can do nothing without Him. I am weak and He is strong. Remind yourself of those things. You're nothing without God's grace. You can do nothing without Him. And you are weak. Oh, but He's strong. God's with you. You've got to trust Him. All right, there's another one that I see that led to Peter's downfall, and that was fatigue. Fatigue. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to stay awake with him and pray. He's about to be betrayed, and he's going to seek God. He's going to ask God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. He's saying, God, I don't want to go to the cross, but I'm willing to do it. But he takes Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, those three that were closest to him, and takes them and says, stay here and pray. Pray for me. Pray for the situation. And instead, they were just too tired and they, and they fell asleep. Fatigue will do that to you. When you should be praying, you fall asleep. 
When you should be watching, you just can't keep your eyes open. When you're facing danger, your mind is just too clouded to even think straight. And when people talk about the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter, James, and John and how they, they failed Jesus and they fell asleep, they, they often talk or preach about the dangers of prayerlessness. But think about it for a moment. What was really behind this prayerlessness that night? Was it rebellion? What, was it a lack of faith? No. Was it apathy? No, it, it was fatigue. Peter didn't pray that night in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was just too tired. Vince Lombardi, a famous coach, used to say, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And it's true. It makes cowards of us, but it also makes failures of us. And I'm telling you, if you're doing too much, going too much, if you're burning the candle at both ends and pushing yourself to your physical limits every, every day or day after day, you, you are setting yourself up for a fall. Study the life of Jesus. Study His ministry. During His three, three and a half years of ministry, if you study it, there are 14 different occasions during this time in which Jesus took a retreat. He would go and, and get away from people. Some, some would say he took a little vacation or a, a little mini retreat or a sabbatical, but he would get away e either alone or, or sometimes just taking his disciples and getting them away from everyone else and stepping away from the public ministry 14 times in three years. And, and some of us haven't taken 14 days off in the last three years. It's leading to fatigue. Life lesson four is this. It is biblical to take time to rest. So do so before you fall. Take the time to rest before you cause yourself to have a setback. When you look all of these things, look at them, combine them all together, you see Peter's fatigue, you see his overconfident ego. You see his impulsiveness. And all these things came together on the night that Jesus is betrayed and he's arrested. And Peter hits rock bottom. And you probably know what happens. I mean, it's recorded in, in Luke chapter 22. Jesus is taken away. He's about to be tried for blasphemy. Peter follows behind at some distance, and, and while he warmed himself by a fire, someone asked him, Weren't you with Jesus? No, Peter said. I don't know him. And a moment later, someone else said, You were with him. Your accent gives you away. And again, Peter insisted it wasn't him. And then he was asked a third time, Are you one of them? Peter began to called down curses on himself and said, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And from across the courtyard, Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter remembered that Jesus had told him this very thing would happen. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So if you've blown it, if you've caused yourself to have a setback, how do you turn it around? To see that, I want to take you to the end of Peter's life. and Peter, ultimately, he would be crucified and he would have to die a martyr's death himself. And before he's crucified, he, he asks that they would crucify him upside down. And he said, I am not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord. Many think that Peter's dying request was somehow connected to his, his famous failure. And if you think that's the case, you probably think Peter lived out the rest of his life in guilt and shame because of denying Christ and failing in such a public way. But that's not the case. 
Because when you look, in, look at the book of Acts and you see Peter and see everything in that he, he did, and I mean, he doesn't look like the same guy that he did in the Gospels. They, they look like two different people. And when you read First and Second Peter, he never mentions, not even once, about the time in which he denied Christ. He, he doesn't act like a man that is overcome with the guilt of his past, of his failure, of his very public shame. Instead, Peter is full of the Holy Ghost and the power of it, and he has been given a mandate from, from Christ himself to go feed his sheep, to make disciples, and he, he speaks with authority, with power, and with confidence. And he tells his readers even to practice self-control. Peter tells us to be holy, to avoid hypocrisy, and to live for God. I mean, that's pretty incredible that someone who had such a public failure, such a setback, could then speak to us and give us that advice. In the book of Acts, I mean, Peter did amazing things, starting in Acts 2, where he, he preaches the message and 3,000 souls are saved that day. Soon after that, he pulls a crippled man up to his feet and told him to rise and walk in the name of Jesus, and the man was instantly healed. Jewish authorities came to Peter and told him to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, and he courageously looks and says to them, I will not be silent. And then later he is miraculously freed from prison. In fact, God used Peter in such a powerful way that even when he would walk down the street, people would try to just get into a place where his shadow would, be, would fall across them so that they could be healed. And he walked under the power and the authority of God, and God used him mightily, even after his failure. So how, how is it then this man can do that? How, how is it that he can overcome his setback? I mean, he was found weeping alone over his failure. Can we have that kind of comeback from, from failure too? Yeah, absolutely. We can have comebacks after our setbacks. It, it's possible. By, by the grace of God, it's possible. Because of His mercy, it's possible. Because of the power of God, it's possible. Peter made a comeback, and so can you. And there may be some of you that are watching this right now, and maybe you're even feeling like it's too late for a comeback, or believe that you've fallen too far and that you've gone too far and things will never turn around. And I want you to know that's not true. I mean, the game's not over. <laughs> There's still time on the clock, and you can turn things around. And no matter how far that you may have fallen, no matter how bad your mess up may have been, man, you can turn things around. God, God can turn things around if you allow Him. God will turn things around, but He won't do it without you. I mean, you've got to do your part. Your part, I mean, by faith, and He does His part, He does the impossible, by His mighty power. And here's Life Lesson 5, and then I'm, I'm finished. The first step in a comeback is making the decision to stay in the game as long as there's time on the clock. you got to stay in the game. You can't quit. You can't give up. You'll never experience a comeback if you quit before the game's over. If you quit before this life is over, stay in the game. Keep seeking God. Be, be diligent about it. Be prayerful about it. But you stay in the game and seek Him and wait, wait for the miraculous. Wait for the miraculous to happen. And watch God. Watch Him bring about a comeback. I want to pray for you as we close tonight. Heavenly Father, I, I pray for those that are watching this, this message tonight. And I, 
Father, I pray for them. I pray that they be inspired, that they be challenged, that their faith be stirred. That, Father, they, they won't focus on their failures or their setbacks, but, God, they'll focus on you, your love, your mercy, your grace and forgiveness, your ability and desire to restore. And so I pray, God, that they, they put all their hope trust and faith in you I pray God that they turn it over to you I pray Lord that they quit trying to handle things or just fix everything themselves but they will turn it to you father I know that it's your desire to bring them through Lord touch them bless them bring them through Bring them through their setbacks. Bring them through their failures. Bring them out of their mess. May they have a glorious comeback for you. I pray it in the mighty, holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching with us tonight. God bless you.